um, maho and my hair. Um, when you walk through the end, you can hear a. You record. can hear the bird song. I mean, there's a whole another disc. Uh, you can hear a woman actually doing a karanga. I mean, it's a whole other discussion whether that should how appropriate that is. However, you're actually being pofidied home, and if it's your first time to Aotearoa, New Zealand, you're, you're actually being pofidied here. So, it, in a very um, modern way. Um, so you know, I think it's just um, which is a lovely thing to have happen even before you've got to go through officials and get your passport checked and do all of that stuff. Mm. It's nice to receive a welcome. Does it vary? You know, do do w- within the basic structure which we'd all be familiar with. Are there variations according to different iwi? Oh, t- definitely. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I would say um, Obama yesterday got the full. Pofiri, you know, he got a wero. There were three um, Māori warriors that went forward to um, challenge him and, and you know, in, a, in a way, welcome him as well. So, you know, that doesn't happen at every pofiri, obviously. Um, so, it's... what will Ed Sheeran get? Do you imagine? Will he get the full version? Oh. Uh, I think so. Oh, <laughs> I wouldn't have a clue. Probably. I mean, <laughs> there'd be no reason for him not. Ed there'd be Sheeran no reason. Gives the him. same as Obama. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this was sort the of same. what I was Ed getting Sheeran at. should have someone yeah. challenging with a ukulele or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they could put down a few guitar strings instead yeah. of a, a raka. They could put a little tucky. <laughs> the, t- the tucky could be some because t- guitar strings. That could be a good challenge for him to try and string them up quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some elasticity in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it really depends one on the, who's performing uh, the poor. Uh, the timing they're allowed I mean that's one another issue that happens around a lot of these pōwhiri for officials there's a really time there's lots of time constraints around it um, uh, I imagine you know because there's a lot of security especially a lot of security yesterday with um, Barack Obama so you know uh, I, I imagine the Ngāti Whātua if Ngāti Whātua had or Rake had their way they would have had the entire iwi there but mm. there wasn't it was a, I mean you know there had to be limits. They, I'm yeah. sure there was limits. So, you know, all those kind of things. So, you know, he was on s- such a tight schedule, you know, that, that you know, um, Tangata Whenua and Māori who are, who are conducting these pōwhiri, especially for officials, there's a lot of constraints around mm. them. Around and well. does, all right. Shannon, does that cheat, cheapen the whole ritual if you have to, you know, condense it? I th- uh, well, it definitely didn't for Ngāti Whātua or Rake. They were very proud um, they were very proud to be part of the process yesterday. So it just means they can't be in full flight. You know, sometimes you can't be in full flight of what is on offer sometimes in terms of a porphyry. You know, they have to keep things a lot shorter than... And tighter. And tighter. Mm. All right, speaking of tighter, we're running out of time. Thank you very much, Shannon. Um, and I want to go quickly to Teresa Gooch, who's been on the last shift, the last production shift today at Dunedin's Cadbury factory. Hi, Teresa. Hi. How was it? Uh, yeah, no, it was pretty good. Um, we've still got one shift going, however. Um, night shift's still running. How long have you worked there? Uh, 17 years. 17 years. What do you think, panel? Do you care about where your pineapple lumps are made? They'll be in Australia now. I care deeply. I seriously uh, yeah, care deeply. Yeah, yeah. I do care, yeah. Um, it's a real shame for New Zealand and Dunedin. Um, but yeah, I guess um, I've come to a stage where we've just got to accept what's, what's, what's coming. Happened. Thank you very much. Thank you for making time to talk to us. Teresa Gooch, the last shift, the last production shift at Dunedin. Thank you, Amanda Miller, for your time on the panel. And good luck, Raybon. Good luck with the last <laughs> Thanks, week. Noelle. Yes, watch out for the sand flies. <laughs> and, and the I'll, air horns in I'll Kaitaia. Splash. And yeah, don't thanks. forget, there's pineapple chunks still. <laughs>
RNZ News at 5 o'clock. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. China has unveiled plans to impose tariffs on up to $3 billion worth of American imports in retaliation against U.S. tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminium products. Earlier today, the U.S. President Donald Trump signed a memorandum to slap tariffs on $60 billion worth of Chinese goods. China has urged the U.S. to pull back from the brink, but says while it doesn't want a trade war, it's not afraid of engaging in one. New Zealand's Trade Minister David Parker says the sudden escalation in trade threats is alarming. We are taking it very seriously. I think these sorts of situations highlight the importance of having clear and agreed rules for trade. Uh, we think that's in New Zealand's interest. We don't have you know, a lot of economic muscle born of size, so we're reliant on rules-based institutions. David Parker. A guide has died after a rafting accident on the Shotover River near Queenstown this morning. The man was flown to Lakes District Hospital but later died. Conan Young reports. The police say the raft overturned near Rapids. It's understood five others on board managed to escape uninjured. Police are working with the rafting company Queenstown Rafting and Maritime New Zealand to work out what happened. The death has been referred to the coroner. A spokesperson for Real Journeys, which owns Queenstown Rafting, has not responded to calls. The police say their thoughts are with the man's family at this time. Call Conan Young Tene. A wired up a man in a wheelchair and his family have until April the 1st to find a new home, but nothing has met his needs. They've been on the social housing register since the end of January. The couple have been working with the Ministry of Social Development and Trust House, but so far none of the properties have met the needs of the man, who is also legally blind. The charitable organisation's chief executive, Alan Pollard, says they've never seen such a demand for social housing, with about 50 people people on the waiting list. He says they have plans to build new houses, but they need the capital from the government to make it happen. The Hokitika Wild Foods Festival has come under fire for an advertisement it used on social media that some are describing as racist cultural appropriation. The ad features a woman wearing a Native American headdress and Māori designs alongside the festival's logo. Māori cultural advisor Karaitiana Tairu says it was disgusting and inappropriate to use traditional cultural wear to sell the festival. But the Westland District Mayor, Bruce Smith, says there's nothing wrong with the image. Ngāti Waiwai, uh, who are our local Renanga, don't think there's anything wrong with it. And uh, we take advice on these things and I, I see no issue at all with it. Western Mayor Bruce Smith. The organisers deleted the image today after hundreds of people called for its removal on social media. Um, an immunisation expert says thousands of school students competing at national sports tournaments this week could spread mumps around the country. At least three tournament organisers for rowing, volleyball and waka'ama say they have not received warnings or advice about mumps, which is at epidemic levels in Auckland. The Auckland University Immunisation Advisory Centre's Nikki Turner says health authorities need to take more responsibility. She says mumps travels easily through teenagers who are sociable and already have low rates of immunity. People can have mumps and not have symptoms. It's highly feasible that teenagers, adolescents will go to these big tournaments and mix and spread mumps to others. I would expect that to be highly likely. Nikki Turner from the Immunisation Advisory Centre. Takaka Hill Road will close at 7 o'clock tonight after being open all afternoon. The only route in and out of Golden Bay reopened to traffic from midday after rain halted all work on fixing damage from Cyclone Gita in February. The road is normally only open at either end of the day to enable repairs to take place unimpeded by traffic. The twice daily convoys will resume tomorrow morning at 7. Within hours, the final pineapple lumps will roll off the production line at Cadbury's Dunedin factory. At the time of closure was signalled a year ago, 350 workers were at the site. But Cadbury's eight-decade history of producing chocolate in Dunedin ends when the last 30 or so manufacturers finish their shifts. Workers have felt the sombre atmosphere this week. Teresa Gooch says it's time to move on.
Well, it's pretty quiet. Um, I think everyone's pretty much ready to go. You know, it's been pretty tough here. Um, yeah, with most of the factory pretty much gone, really. There's more contractors here tearing the place down than there is workers. So, yeah, it's um, not an easy time. And I think I think we're, yeah, ready to get out of here. <laughs> it's five past five. The Black Caps captain Kane Williamson has become New Zealand cricket's most prolific test century maker. Williamson has scored his 18th test hundred on day two of the day-night test against England at Eden Park in Auckland. He started the day on 91 and here's how he brought up his milestone 100 with commentary from Sky TV. 99. Yes, he'll get it. He'll get it. It'll run away from the misfield. That is number 18. That is historic. Go to the top of the class, Kane Williamson. It's a signature shot, isn't it? That nudge down behind square on the offside. What a player he is. Williamson, Ross Taylor and the late Martin Crowe had previously shared the record for most centuries at 17. He was finally dismissed for 102 with New Zealand 229 for four a short time ago when rain stopped play, a lead of 171. The Silver Ferns are hoping the return of senior players Maria Falau and Kayla Cullen can turn around their fortunes in the tiny Jameson netball competition when New Zealand play Fiji tonight. The Silver Ferns suffered a surprise 59-51 to 51 loss to Jamaica and coach Janine Southby says with the Commonwealth Games just under two weeks away, they have to turn it around and show some urgency against Fiji if they're to advance to Sunday's final. And the four-time Formula One world champion Lewis Hamilton has posted the fastest lap time in the opening practice at the Australian Grand Prix in Melbourne. New Zealand's Brendan Hartley and his Toro Rosso car was some way off the pace, over three and a half seconds behind Hamilton. And that's the news. Tomorrow morning, Alex Perry on the secret weapon used against the immensely powerful Calabrian Mafia, the women. Cenk Yuga, co-founder of the largest online news network in the world, the Young Turks. Marcus Davy on a machine that mimics the womb for very premature babies. And author Gigi Fenster plays with a temperature control for her memoir, Feverish. Join me, Kim Hill, tomorrow morning from 8 on RNZ National. And now the short forecast until midnight tomorrow. Northland to Tomaranui, including Coromandel Bay of Plenty and Taupo. Showers, some heavy and possibly thundery. Gisborne, Hawke's Bay, fine spells, but also a few showers. Taranaki, rain developing this afternoon with heavy and thundery falls until later tomorrow. Whanganui and Taihape to Wellington also widened up. Showers clearing and fine spells increasing, but uh, rain returning tomorrow, mainly from afternoon when heavy and thundery falls are possible, especially about the ranges. Marlborough, Nelson, Buller and Westland. Outbreaks of rain, possibly heavy and thundery at times. Canterbury and Otago, excluding Clutha. Showers spreading south today. Some may be heavy and possibly thundery in Otago and the south of Canterbury tomorrow. Clutha, Southland and Fiordland, partly cloudy, but a few showers about the south coast spreading elsewhere tomorrow. Some heavy and possibly thundery during the afternoon. And for the Chatham Islands, fine spells. RNZ National, it's eight past five, and you're listening to Checkpoint with John Campbell. And Anna Thomas reading the news. Thank you very much, Anna. If you want updates on the cricket, the update is that it is raining cats and dogs in Auckland as we speak in that day-night test match, day two, New Zealand. Uh, developing a very good lead is not taking place as we speak. We will update you if they return to the field, but it seems the pitch, sorry, but it seems a way off. The world's two largest economies stand on the brink of a trade war, with China this afternoon threatening to place tariffs on $3 billion of US imports. Some kind of response was inevitable, of course, after US President Donald Trump announced he wants to impose tariffs on up to $60 billion US dollars worth of imports from China. But we have one particular problem, and I view them as a friend. I have tremendous respect for President Xi. We have a great relationship. They're helping us a lot in North Korea, and that's China. But we have a trade deficit, depending on the way you calculate, of $504 billion. Now, some people would say it's really $375 billion. 
Many different ways of looking at it, but any way you look at it, it is the largest deficit of any country in the history of our world. It's out of control. We have a tremendous intellectual property theft situation going on, which likewise is hundreds of billions of dollars. And that's on a yearly basis. Donald Trump. Well, the language was reasonably incendiary. Share marks in Asia and the U.S. fell heavily on that language and the news of China's response. Even though China's response was considered by many to be relatively moderate so far, and given New Zealand's reliance on trade, the government here says it's taking any notion of a tit-for-tat trade war very seriously. Of course, here's our deputy political editor, Chris Bramwell. Donald Trump says China is stealing the U.S.'s technology and intellectual property, prompting him to unveil his plans for massive tariffs on Chinese products. China, in turn, this afternoon unveiled plans to levy duties on up to $3 billion worth of U.S. imports in response to the steel and aluminium tariffs which come into effect today. China has assembled a list of 128 U.S. products that could be targeted if the two countries can't reach an agreement on trade issues. New Zealand's Trade Minister David Parker says the sudden escalation in trade threats is alarming. We are taking it very seriously. I think these sorts of situations highlight the importance of having clear and agreed rules for trade. Uh, we think that's in New Zealand's interest. We don't have you know, a lot of economic muscle born of size, so we're reliant on rules-based institutions. Mr Parker says China and the US need to show restraint as a tit-for-tat escalation doesn't benefit anyone. I think we need to be a bit careful not to overreact. There's lots of threats being made, but it's not yet clear what is going to eventuate. We don't know enough really to take a final position. When we do take a position, it will be based on our independent foreign policy. Greg Autry co-authored a book called Death by China with Peter Navarro, who is now Donald Trump's Director of Trade Policy. Mr Autry says Donald Trump's negotiating style is to make a bold and forceful opening move and then see whether accommodations can be reached. The Dow Jones index fell 3% after Mr Trump's announcement, but Greg Autry told CNN the President spent a year talking to the Chinese to no avail and now he's taking action. If we allow those intellectual properties developed by American taxpayers and American companies to simply be stolen because we're afraid of the Dow dropping 2% or 3% in a day, we are going to be the world's patsies. And the Chinese government understands that. These are Chinese state-owned organizations that target these American companies when they steal these products and put them out of business. It is an integrated policy in Beijing, and it should have been dealt with years ago. The executive director of the New Zealand China Council, Stephen Jacoby, says everybody would agree that there are issues with the protection of intellectual property in China, but whether that is as bad as the US is alleging is a matter for debate. The problem is that the United States is trying to address this problem by putting tariffs on other products that have nothing to do with intellectual property. So they'll be taxing, presumably, China's exports of clothing and apparel and manufactured products to the United States. That is not only going to affect those industries in the United States, it's going to cause massive damage to international trade. Mr Jacoby says New Zealand could actually stand to benefit if China does slap tariffs on US agricultural products. Well, it's no secret that New Zealand is an agriculture exporter to China, so the extent that the Chinese seek to block or to put raised tariffs on US products possibly opens up opportunity for New Zealand. But there's a bigger picture here, and that is nobody benefits from this sort of action in the longer term. It disrupts markets, it takes out confidence, and New Zealand could well be damaged by those sorts of things, even if we might benefit, depending on what action is taken. The Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, says New Zealand is closely watching what happens offshore and will maintain its line that open global trade is a good thing. We continue to be a country that benefits hugely from multilateral trade agreements that uh, always has argued against uh, situations where we might have tariff wars. Uh, and so for us, it's all about maintaining that position. New Zealand has sought an exemption to the US administration's steel and aluminium tariffs due to come into effect today. The US trade chief has listed a number of countries that will be exempt, including Canada, Mexico and Australia. But Jacinda Ardern isn't worried about that just yet, saying the government will wait for a formal response from the United States. Chris Coming up to quarter past five and we'll have more on trade later on the programme.
Regional mayors are calling for an interline agreement with Air New Zealand to force the airline to promote regions it doesn't directly fly to. This comes, of course, after Regional Economic Development Minister Shane Jones called out Air New Zealand this week for axing regional routes. Most recently, it's Auckland to Kapiti service. Mayors in areas where New Zealand now doesn't land say it's a double whammy. Not only do they not get the national airline bringing them tourists, business people and other visitors with money to spend, they don't get the benefit of the national airline's promotional push like having their towns and cities endorsed and promoted in the Air New Zealand Calder magazine. The mayors have told Checkpoint Air New Zealand could help even if they don't land. First they could promote their New Zealand towns as well as the ones the airline does visit. Secondly they could load their destinations onto the Air New Zealand website working alongside the smaller carriers and finally they could check luggage all the way through working with the smaller airlines to make sure baggage bags get all the way from Wellington to Whakatane for example rather than being offloaded in Auckland. Bridget Burke travels to the places Air New Zealand won't. Whakatane Mayor Tony Bond says it's time for Air New Zealand to step up as a national airline that acknowledges the provinces, even the towns and cities it doesn't fly to. Currently we are silent. Uh, if you look at an Air New Zealand book, Whakatane doesn't exist. They don't market Whakatane anymore. He blames current Chief Executive Christopher Luxon for a change of direction, which, since his appointment in 2013, has seen the airline axe services to Hamilton, Wanaka, Westport, Taupo, Whakatane, Whanganui and Kaitaia. When the board decided to phase out all the small aircraft and only have large ones, they never gave the opportunity to even try in Whakatane. They just pulled the plug. Mr Bond says since Air Chathams took over the service three years ago, flights have fallen from around $1,000 return via Auckland to Wellington to around $600. But he says the Whakatane region gets no marketing from Air New Zealand and he's written to the Transport Minister Phil Twyford today urging him to push Air New Zealand for an interline agreement. Now I think that what he needs to do with Chris is talk to him about how Air New Zealand's marketing themselves as a national airline if they want to retain that national airline status, why don't they embrace the feeder airlines which have come in since they've pulled out and actually are feeding their main trunk lines? Air New Zealand cancelled services to Westport in 2015. Sounds Air took over with regular flights to Wellington, but Buller District Mayor Gary Howard says Air New Zealand's decision still hurts. We've got a wonderful service from Sounds Air with 26 flights per week, but it's actually having... Uh, the provincial link that can go right through so you're not having to ch check off one particular uh, flight service and then check into another flight service and I'm really perplexed about why Air New Zealand does not allow such a uh, system to actually come into place. Both mayors Howard and Bond say an interline agreement which embraces all airports regardless of size is vital to support regional growth. The interline agreement means where somebody can go seamless from Whakatane through to Wellington. Uh, our bags are booked in in Whakatane and it will just end up in Wellington. So it's, that's where we need uh, Air New Zealand to actually come to is accept the fact that they don't want to come into some provincial airports but please, why don't they work in with these feeder airlines? The other thing that frustrates business travellers that uh, go from Whakatane, um, I know going down to Wellington's no problem because in between you can go into the, um, the, the Coro Lounge, but on the way home, no, you're not allowed to go into the Coro Lounge because you're flying with a feeder airline. So that's a little thing that is not that important, but it is important to those business travellers. Air New Zealand announced earlier this month that service between the Kapiti Coast and Auckland is the latest to face the axe. Mayor K. Gurunathan says Air New Zealand has an obligation to ensure another airline, most likely Air Chathams, takes over the service. I think even if they don't have a commercial responsibility to ensure the viability of our economies and our social links to the main centres, they have a moral responsibility. Mr Guru Nathan says Kapiti Coast residents were shocked the decision came just days after more than a thousand people turned out to an airport open day. They are gutted, you know, which means they've got to go all the way to Wellington. You know, and in Wellington traffic down there is a nightmare. Or they have to go up to um, uh, Palmerston North. And the um, coroner recently on the road links from here, the, the new road links that have been proposed from here to... Um, to uh, Levin, uh, to Palmerston North, 
you know, that's been called the killing fields. Transport Minister Phil Twyford said he can't force Air New Zealand to fly into regions that aren't commercially viable. By the same token, we are the major shareholder, and I think it's, it's only right that uh, Air New Zealand should listen to and take into account um, the government's views. So that's, that's why I'll be sitting down with Christopher Luxon and, and having that conversation. I, I, I'm sure after the events of the last week, that uh, Mr Luxon's under no illusion about our government's commitment to regional economic development and our concern about the loss of air services. But I want to know, um, moving forward, what Air New Zealand's plans are for the regions. Sounds Air, Great Barrier Airlines and Air Chathams have taken over the routes abandoned by Air New Zealand. Air Chathams General Manager Dwayne Emini says the airline has held previous discussions with Air New Zealand about interlining and allowing tourists to book flights through the Air New Zealand website through to provincial airports. They uh, did give us reasons for why that would be difficult, um, especially with uh, Whakatane. Our reservation system simply wasn't uh, capable. Mr Emini says he's hopeful Air Chathams can take over the company to Auckland service. So right now we're just in the uh, last stages of due diligence around the um, performance, so takeoff and landing performance at that airport. Uh, we've got a third party performance company working through the data that's been supplied to us by the airport company. I've been very forthcoming with that and uh, hopefully by early next week uh, we'll have uh, the information we need to be able to make a, uh, a call on whether it's a, a route that we can service um, adequately. Buller District Mayor Gary Howard says Shane Jones has shown Air New Zealand has become a volume carrier with a disregard for the regions. Air New Zealand has lost its provincial respect when it actually withdrew its services and it's no longer what I would regard as a national carrier. They have made a strategic change and I do think that they will actually regret that, that uh, severing themselves from community links uh, and services, which was a strategic advantage and no longer, and uh, I think they've lost their identity as New Zealand's national carrier. For Checkpoint, Bridget Burke. We saw comment from Air New Zealand about whether they would welcome an interline agreement and some of the other issues raised in that story. We have received no response from them. It's 22 minutes past five. On his last day in the country, former United States President Barack Obama brunched with a group of Māori women, uh, business and community leaders. 20 members of the Wahine Toa program were hosted by former United States Ambassador to New Zealand Mark Gilbert and his wife Nancy Gilbert this morning. The private briefing was Mr Obama's final appointment on his three-day tour. To Mane Kōrehi reporter John Boynton has more. Linnell Hudia is New Zealand's first Māori patent lawyer. This morning she joined a formidable lineup of Māori wahine leaders at a private lunch with Barack Obama. She first met Nancy Gilbert in 2015 and says the brunch with the former president was inspirational. It was pretty amazing. It was pretty awesome, really inspiring and... Yeah, just overwhelmed to have this opportunity to be in his presence. Yeah, really cool. Wahine Toa was set up by Mrs Gilbert in 2015, while Mr Obama was still president, to give emerging Māori female leaders a voice. So he talked about community development and growing our future leaders as well. That's really important for the continuation, particularly for Māori. Mr Obama told the women they have the ability to be inspirational around the world. I think just keep doing what we're doing is really the message that he gave. He was really impressed with the, uh, you know, the calibre of women in the room, how wonderful they are, what they're doing. Speaking after the brunch, Nancy Gilbert said she may have given the woman a few too many instructions before meeting the president. I was a bit strict beforehand, um, warning them not to talk too long and not to interrupt the others and not to repeat what someone else said. He sort of instilled some fear into them, so they were more afraid of me than of him. The reins of the program have now been handed to Gail Brown, the wife of current United States Ambassador Scott Brown. Plans are now in place to expand the program to include Pacifica women leaders. But Nancy says she was proud to see how the 20 women who first entered the program in 2015 had flourished. I truly felt like a mother sort of giving birth or having a little birdie and giving it wings and watching them all fly away. So they were great and it was a really great honour and a privilege. Barack Obama, Nancy says, reminded the woman 
no issue is too small. If you have an issue that's in the grassroots and in your neighborhood, that's the good place to start. And once you repair problems at the lowest level, you can work your way up the food chain. Mark Gilbert says he was impressed by the stories the woman shared with the president. The women of Wahine Toa were so excellent. They told the story of their lives and growing up in New Zealand. And he's sure former First Lady Michelle Obama would be impressed with the work Wahine Tua does as well. You want to talk about a laugh. The president said this last night, so I'm sure a lot of people heard it, but he brought it up again this morning that he was here on a reconnaissance trip for the First Lady, for Michelle, and he hopes to be able to, to bring her back. Mo te hōtaka o te ahi pōnei, ko John Pointe naho. Uh, one of the pitches for Barack Obama's trip was that we were going to be showcasing New Zealand to the world via the coverage, uh, international coverage his visit would achieve. Later in Checkpoint, we'll look at what international coverage his visit did get while he was here. It's 25 minutes past five. A disabled Wairarapa man and his family appear likely to end up homeless in just over a week's time because despite searching for a house anywhere in the North Island, they've been unable to find one that meets their needs. Sam and Del Bennett and their 24-year-old son have to move out of their home during Easter weekend as their landlord wants it back for his own use. The family has been searching for a new home for three months now, both privately and with the help of the Ministry of Social Development and their local social housing provider. But they have yet to find one that is available and wheelchair accessible. Reporter Charlie Drever and cameraman Richard Tinderland drove out to Tauhiriniko, which is just east, of, just east of Featherston in the southern Wairarapa, to pay them a visit. Del Bennett was up till 3 a.m. this morning, her heart and mind racing out of fear of what's ahead. Mainly fear of the unknown, because she has no idea where her family will be in just over a week's time. She spends her days frantically packing up their belongings into boxes, caring for her husband, Sam, and searching for a new house, anywhere in the North Island. But she's not having any luck. It's very frustrating. Um, the few that are there that we've been to viewings, there's some of them are 10 minutes and I call them the cattle calls. You could have 20 families all fighting to get into view one home. One we went to at Pahiatua, there was um, just people from everywhere, Tauranga, um, Waikato, Gisborne, all over the country trying to find an affordable home. It's a tough housing market, but it's even tougher when you have specific needs and a beneficiary's income. Del and her son are full-time carers for Sam, who is legally blind and in a wheelchair, due to complications from his diabetes. She's been looking at properties, but none have been suitable. Because Sam's in a chair, we need something that has wider doorways and sort of that we can make accessible. We have a portable ramp that we can get up a couple of steps and um, we can work around most things. One of the houses we looked at, the only way that we could actually get him in was um, he'd have to live in the garage. It did actually have a toilet and a shower in the garage, mm -hmm. but um, you know, a cup of tea or food would all have to be delivered down the stairs to the little troll in the basement. <laughs> the couple have had to give up two of their dogs to increase their chances of finding a rental. And while they're hoping to keep their long-haired chihuahua Bentley, they accept they might have to find him a new home in order for them to find their new home. Sam Bennett say their story is tough, but it's just one of many. I, I go, don't go to all the viewings because I just can't, because my health, I just can't, I just feel... Well, it doesn't travel very well for a start, travel so. very well, no. But we've talked to people that are there, and we've heard their stories too, and it's just as tragic as ours. Mm. But people who, who say, you know, what's your end date? Because we don't have to be out quite yet, so we won't apply for this one, so you've got more of a yeah. chance. That's the kind of people that you do meet. They're absolutely awesome people. The family has been on the Ministry of Social Development Housing Register since the end of January. And Wairapa's sole social housing provider, Trust House, has also been working with them. Its CEO, Alan Pollard, says their problem is there are just not enough houses. 
especially over the last two years, we've never seen demand uh, like we currently have. We, for example, you know, four or five years ago, our occupancy at Trust House was around 93%, and today it's in excess of 99 uh, We only have two vacancies. In both of those houses, we have tenants waiting to tenant the properties, and uh, we have another 50 families waiting who have applications for, for houses when they become available. Trust House has appealed to MSD to partner with it to deliver more social housing places in the wide Appa. A spokesperson for MSD says they're considering the request and are committed to working collaboratively with it. In the meantime, it has offered the family one house, which wasn't wheelchair accessible, and has invited them to view another property next week. But even if it is suitable, it's likely to need modifications, which will first have to be approved, then might take three months to complete. Meanwhile, Dell is left wondering how it's gotten to this. We're not the, the, the stereotype, homeless, drunk, wino lurking in a back. Um, it's us, families who are working with kids who are sleeping in cars. It's, what happened to our country? Concerned all motels might be booked out over Easter weekend, Dell has booked her and her son into a cabin with bunk beds and Sam into a rest home. It's a temporary fix and one she's hoping MSD will reimburse her for. A spokesperson for MSD said it will meet with the family on the 3rd of April or they will learn where they will be staying that night. It seems likely they'll end up in emergency housing in a motel, but it's not clear where or for how long. For Checkpoint, I'm Charlie Drever. You are with Checkpoint on RNZ. Coming up another day at the White House, and another top aid bites the dust. We just recycle that sting, actually. We've used it so often. Donald Trump appoints a new security advisor a week out from the biggest fight of his career. We visit Joseph Parker's gym in the Auckland suburb of Papa Toy Toy to find out where it all began. And in just three hours' time, the last pineapple lump ever to be made in New Zealand will roll off the conveyor belt as Cadbury prepares to close the doors of its Dunedin factory for good. There has been a confectionery operation there for about a hundred and 50 years. We'd love your feedback. Uh, whatever subject you want to discuss, lots of you already getting in touch on Air New Zealand flying or not flying uh, to some of the towns and cities uh, that they have uh, forsaken. Um, for want of a less pejorative term, in the past three or four years, uh, text us 2101, email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. We are, of course, on Twitter and Facebook. Nona is next, furiously scribbling beside me with the latest business news, but before it all... Calm as always, Anna Thomas with the headlines. Thanks, John. Disgraced Waikato Health Chief Nigel Murray has repaid about $75,000 to his former employer. Dr Murray resigned in October after spending $218,000 over three years on travel, accommodation and related expenses. The District Health Board's acting chair, Sally Webb, says the repaid money meant it had recouped everything that could be easily identified as personal spending in the misuse of public money. New Zealand's Trade Minister David Parker says he's alarmed by the sudden escalation in trade threats by America and China. China has unveiled plans to impose tariffs on American imports in retaliation against US tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminium products. And the New Zealand share market has ended down 1% after Wall Street dived on fears of a global trade war. Asian markets also fell in line with the main markets in the United States which closed down about 3%. The Hokitika Wild Foods Festival has come under fire for using a Native American headdress and Māori designs alongside the festival's logo. A Māori cultural advisor says it's inappropriate to use traditional cultural wear to sell the festival. The Western District Mayor says there's nothing wrong with the image. An immunisation expert says mumps could be spread around New Zealand as thousands of school students compete at national sports tournaments this week. The disease is at epidemic levels in Auckland. The Immunisation Advisory Centre says mumps travels easily through teenagers who are sociable and already have low rates of immunity. Tonga's Prime Minister says a letter from the Ministry of Education and Training to Tonga High School banning girls from participating in rugby and boxing is not government policy. 
There was a community outcry this month after the letter said rugby and boxing was against a young woman's dignity and Tongan cultural tradition. And that's the news. Thank you very much indeed, Anna Thomas. We've got quite a lot more on some of those stories coming up. We're going to go to Hokitika and discuss that controversial image. But before it all, Nona Peltier is on the other side of me. Hi, Nona. Uh, we've looked at trade. We've looked at China's response to Donald Trump's uh, tariff threats. Um, let's look at business, setting aside all of that stuff. And um, it's been a big, big week, hasn't it? What have been some of the highlights? Well, we had Dairy Day on Wednesday, and that was where we had the bombshell with Fonterra. Tayo Spearing. And yeah, that's the, right. Yeah. And the and the right down, and then, but of course. On the opposite side of that, we had Sinlay Milk, the specialty milk producer, doing just a roaring old um, performance on the market, driving us up to a record high, which was, you know, quite stunning, and. And then, of course, the following day we had monetary policy, which uh, for the Reserve Bank was kind of, you know, mm. a non-event. Steady but, she goes. Yep. But the U.S. Federal Reserve surprised the market by saying that, you know, because of trade worries, they weren't going to go with four rate hikes, the hikes this year. They were just going to have the two more in addition to the one they announced this week. So that caused a bit of jitters in the market. And then today we had even more with the trade policies announced. Uh, Some sharp falls in Asia. Absolutely. And of course, that, but that's in line with what we saw on Wall Street. I mean, mm. about 3% down there. And I was just looking at uh, the latest we have. It's 3% in Hong Kong. It's 3.5% uh, uh, in Japan and 2% in Australia. And you know, that, that, that is what you would expect to see given the exposure to potential trade war. It's really interesting because China responded as everyone knew they would, but they're actually only responding so far with threats of tariffs on about $3 billion worth of U.S. Yeah. Uh, imports, which actually is a mere drop in the ocean. So China have been measured thus far, and yet Japan has fallen 3%. So if China stops being measured, whoops, a daisy and good night, nurse. Well, no one wants to be monkey in the middle, right? No. No. Including New Zealand. Yeah. The same so, before. but New Zealand, you know, I mean, given everything, we actually ended up the week. Uh, our market ended down um, Not to, very much. well, you know, 85 points. Yeah. That's 1%. And that's still better than where we started the week. Mm. So, you in know. In the context of what was happening in Wall Street and, and all of everything else, Asia, we're yeah. doing pretty well. And even our dollar. Uh, so, okay. So, overall, uh, our market, we ended down. 1%, just under 1%, as a matter of fact, 85 points to 8,515. And when you think about it, that's not so bad because we, you know, we started the week even lower than that. We went all the way up to over 8,600 8, points. So now we're sort of, you know, mm. we're still not that badly off. Now, who knows what's going to happen uh, in the days to come uh, because we still haven't really, all we've seen is a, as, is a bit of smoke. We mm. haven't seen the fire yet. No, that's the truth. Uh, what did the dollar do? Well, the dollar, uh, believe it or not, is holding quite steady at 72.2 US cents, 93.6 Australian, and 51.1 pence. Now, you might be interested to know, with, all, with the other thing that happened, we had Obama all week, right? Mm. And uh, there was a bit of interest about how, how did that actually play through our economy? Westpac is delighted. They were one of the sponsors. Westpac, you're going to say they were delighted, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 so you called them and said, do you reckon this was bang, do you got bang for your buck from having in the country? Yes. And their response they was? was? We're delighted. And I said, well, is it so that uh, Mr. Obama occasionally referred to you as West Bank? And they said, yes. But all publicity is good publicity when it comes to Obama, I guess. Yeah. Thanks, Nadia. We're going to have thing. more on that one story more thing. later on. Air New Zealand share price, believe it or not, moved against the market today, was up a third of a percent, up one cent. To $3.39. This, this is despite what Shane Jones has been saying about them this oh, yeah, week, right? There you go. Nona Peltier, have a wonderful weekend. And Thank you, you very much week. indeed. Cover's still on at Eden Park. The weather in Auckland isn't great. Let's go to the, widths, to the weather uh, across the country now. Mid Service Meteorologist John Law. Kia ora, John. Kia ora. Unfortunately, it is looking like a rather a wet start to the weekend. We have a, th a system off to the west of us set to bring some showers in towards the likes of Northland and Auckland through the daytime, particularly through the afternoon. Some of those fairly heavy and perhaps even with the odd rumble of thunder as well. And that's really the story across that western side of the North Island. One or two heavy falls as we go through the daytime. And just that chance of the odd rumble of thunder as well. Highs out around about 20 to 22 degrees Celsius down that western side. 
Even down in towards Wellington, that cloud thickening up through daytime, some showers of airfield. Again, some of those could be fairly heavy as we go through and towards the afternoon. And temperatures around about 20 degrees Celsius. If you're looking for the drier weather on the North Island, head towards the eastern coast. Places like Gisborne and Napier, a bit more cloud, but generally staying dry and highs there, 23 degrees Celsius. As we head down towards the south line, we have got some wetter weather in Canterbury to start a day. That rain should ease off through the morning time. Still some showers though around for the afternoon. One or two of those again on the old heavy side, but more showers as we go through and towards the afternoon for parts of Southland and Otago. And some wetter weather still with us for that western coast. But it is an improving story for Nelson and Buddha. Some brighter weather through the afternoon, but do keep an eye on those severe weather watches and warnings. And that's it from me. Thank you, John. Have a fantastic weekend. Another day at the White House, another top aide gone. President Donald Trump has moved to replace his national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, with a hardline neoconservative and keen advocate of military power, John Bolton. There'd been speculation for weeks that General McMaster was about to be shown the door. A lot of people are used to seeing that door. Last month, Mr. Trump chastised him after he told a national security conference in Munich that there was incontrovertible evidence of Russian meddling in the 2016 presidential election. The BBC's Chris Buckler says the writing was on the wall. It's no secret that they did clash on a range of issues. President Trump is not a great fan of H.R. McMaster, doesn't believe in some of what his vision is. And I think what we're seeing now is something of a changing of a guard. H.R. McMaster had clashed, for example, with President Trump over the issue of Russia, in which President Trump had given him a strong rebuke. Really, what they want to see inside the White House is a real sense that there is a unity in vision, there's a unity in what is being said, and President Trump doesn't feel that he has that, particularly on the issue of foreign policy. Which raises the question, who is John Bolton? Well, he is a former UN ambassador and a Fox News contributor, Donald Trump's favourite TV network, of course. An official once said, if uh, there was, sorry, there wasn't a war John Bolton didn't want to be in, Chris Buckler says he promises a much more, quote, belligerent foreign policy. Fundamentally, if you take a look at John Bolton, he is someone who has been very tough talking, very hard line on North Korea, very hard talking, very tough talking on Russia. He's called for the Iran nuclear deal to be scrapped. He thinks a lot like President Trump, but you also get a sense as well that he's going to come to this position now and he's going to know that there are quite a lot of eyes on him. But I do think there is a change of the guard in terms of foreign policy. Um, in a statement tonight, this is what John Bolton said. He said, the United States currently faces a wide array of issues, and I look forward to working with President Trump and his leadership team in addressing these complex issues in an effort to make our country safer at home. That's the BBC's Chris Buckler reading a statement because John Bolton didn't talk to the BBC, but he did, of course, speak to Fox News after his appointment. I've never been shy about what my views are, but frankly, what I've said in private now uh, is behind me, at least effective April the 9th. And the important thing is, uh, uh, is what the president says and what advice I give him. I have my views. I I'm sure I'll have a chance to articulate them to the president. Some people don't like people who have substantive views. Uh, they're uh, more process oriented. But if the government can't have a free interchange of ideas among the president's advisors, then I think the president is not well served. John Bolton himself. Commentators in Washington say the decision to appoint Mr Bolton comes as something of a surprise because Donald Trump reportedly decided against naming him as Secretary of State last year because he didn't like, and I'm told this is a quote, his walrus moustache. It is 17 minutes to 6 year with Checkpoint on RNZ. Organisers of the Hokitika Wild Foods Festival have been slammed for an advertisement that features a woman wearing Maori designs and a Native American headdress. Indigenous rights activists describe the image which promotes the festival's 30th anniversary next March as disgusting and an inappropriate use of sacred ceremonial dress. But the district's mayor disagrees, saying it's just PC brigade frothing at the mouth. Te Mano Kōrehi reported Te Aniwa Huri Hanganui has more. The Hokitika Wild Foods Festival, famed for serving up taste bud tingling food like hoo-hoo grubs and mountain oysters, reckons it provides a taste of the wild. But it's not the festival's obscure delicacies that have made Māori cultural advisor Karaitiana Tayuru wild. 
He's hot under the collar about an image it's using of a woman wearing traditional indigenous clothing to promote the festival. It was discussing an inappropriate use of indigenous traditional wear. One can only assume that and they thought that Native Americans, First Nations and Māori are associated with wild food for some reason. Mr Tayuru says men traditionally wear Native American headwear and he's outraged it has been paired with Māori designs. The headwear that the lady's wearing is um, traditionally for men of high rank to wear, not for women, and it's a, a privilege and a right that's earned. But that headgear was also mixed with um, a Māori pattern as well, which just yeah, further mocks the whole situation. The organisers deleted the image today after hundreds of people called for its removal on social media. But Westland District Mayor Bruce Smith doesn't think there's anything wrong with it and says he told the organisers to put it back up. My view is the, the, the PC brigade, are, they're all frothing at their mouth while they drink their lattes in Auckland. We're, we're not in North America. I see the poster got taken down. I've sent a message through saying put it back up. If people don't like it, tell them to... Not watch it. Bruce Smith says he's even got the backing of the local iwi. The festival and our council have got a, a, a very strong and growing relationship with uh, Te Renunga and uh, Ngāti Waiwai, and we stand shoulder to shoulder on this. Te Runanga o Ngāti Waiwai Chair Francis Tumahai says the iwi supports the festival but does not support cultural misappropriation. He says Ngāti Waiwai has not been involved in the development or design of the poster and does not support its use. Indigenous rights advocate Tina Ngata says there's an abundance of literature written by Indigenous people demonstrating that these kinds of images are offensive and unacceptable. She suggests the mayor should read some of it. The literature has been out there and, and, and it's been clearly stated that this is not acceptable practice and that information has been out for quite some time now. So I'd recommend that the mayor and others who like to use this type of imagery educate themselves on that issue. Ms Ngata says both Māori and Native Americans have fought for years to educate the world on why using their cultural taonga outside of their intended purpose is wrong. And she thinks for people to say it isn't an issue is the epitome of privilege. Mo te hōtaka o te ahipone, ko te aniwa, hurihanga nui aho. Let's go to some sport now. Of all the things to have had an influence on the life of New Zealand boxer Joseph Parker, few have played a bigger role than the Papa Toy Toy Boxing Club as Parker prepares for the biggest fight of his career next week in Cardiff. And for once in boxing, that's no overstatement. Our sports reporter Clay Wilson and camera operator Claire Easton Farrelly went to the South Auckland gym where the world heavyweight champ and one uh, tight and one belt learned his trade. There's a certain symmetry to the fact the biggest opportunity of Mose Omatangi Jr's career will come when he fights on the undercard of Joseph Parker's title unification bout against British superstar Anthony Joshua in Cardiff on Easter Sunday. Now 22 and the New Zealand champion in the middleweight division, Omatangi Jr was just 14 when he walked in the door at the Papatoi Toi Boxing Club. By then Parker was a Youth Olympic Games silver medalist and all the attention he was getting served as motivation for a younger boy from the same neck of the woods. When I started training here, Joseph was um, coming up and he, would, he, he was the one getting interviews and I was the one like just, I was one of these skippers, skipping, watching and that motivated me more to train hard and you know, to keep going at it and I'm getting interviews now. And one of these guys that's skipping behind me, they're going to get it too. A founder of and the driving force at the club, Grant Arkel was Parker's amateur coach for almost a decade and he says Almatangi Jr is far from the only one who has been inspired by Parker and others who have pounded the pads at his gym. A lot of little kids, they, 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 they want to be Joseph Parker, just like when David was fighting, everybody wanted to be David Tua. Not that Arkel always expected that Parker would have that effect on others. In fact, he remembers well the day a 10-year-old Parker appeared at the gym and the first few years of what has since become a hugely successful career. Little short, overweight boy, I won't call him fat, he's too big now. Um, wasn't really interested, 
had more fun running around and talking to the others. And his brother John, he was the one who was really keen on doing fitness and punching the bag. Joseph was more interested in fishing. Quite often went, went sick. <coughs> Arkel goes on, explaining how Parker failed to even turn up for several fights in those early years and describing him as a mediocre boxer. But that didn't mean the distractible teenager's coach hadn't noticed the speed, quickly increasing size and above all intelligence. After urging him not to let his natural talents go to waste, Arkel says Parker finally began to start realising some of his potential. He was fighting well out of his class as an amateur. He was fighting mean when he was 16, 15, 16, because I couldn't get anybody else to fight him. Fought a boy that was 20 kilos heavier than him once, and destroyed him in two rounds. While his fighter was on an upward curve, Arkel believes the true turning point did not come until an 18-year-old Parker collected that silver at the 2010 Youth Olympics. Despite his improved dedication, Parker ultimately came up short in his quest to attend the 2012 Olympics in London and soon announced he was going professional. Although he strongly disagreed with that decision, Arkel is happy to admit he has been proven wrong and says the two remain on great terms, with Parker often dropping by the gym when he is back in New Zealand. Comes in here, with sometimes trains with the boys, or signs posters and things like that. Tells him, tells him to train and listen to me, which he didn't do. <laughs> These days though, the Papatauitaui Boxing Club has a new rising star, and Arkel is adamant Aumatangi Jr. can be as good as Parker if he gets a similar level of support. Victory against his unbeaten opponent in Cardiff would be the perfect way to show he deserves that, something Aumatangi Jr. is acutely aware of. I mean, this is probably the biggest opportunity that um, any New Zealand fighter has ever gotten, like, besides Joseph, and, you know, um, and I'm just blessed to, to get this opportunity. But both me and my coach are blessed, you know, because um, this is make or break it. This can open like many doors for us if things go right for us and if we do well, I mean, the world's our oyster, you know. <laughs> With proof of Parker's success set to be everywhere Aumatangi Jr. looks, you can be sure inspiration won't be an issue. Moti Hotaka, Oti Ahipo Nei, Ko Clay Wilson Aho. Beautiful pictures in that story shot and edited by Claire Easton Farrelly. Eight and a half to six feedback on Air New Zealand. If Air New Zealand would let us send our bags through to a New Zealand, Air New Zealand flight, I would be very happy as Air Chathams is a much more comfortable flight at the moment. If I want to fly overseas, it's anybody but Air New Zealand. Quite a lot of stuff with that kind of tone coming in. Cathy says, I live close to Kapiti Airport, but today I was flying from Wellington to Christchurch. I set off early with what should have been an hour to spare once in Wellington. However, it crashed north of Porirua, stopped traffic from Pukirua Bay, and I, of course, missed my flight through no fault of my own. Air New Zealand charged $380 for a later flight. Road access to Wellington is frequently subject to delays, so it creates a great chance for Air New Zealand to further inflate their profits. Uh, thank you for your feedback. You can text us 2101 and email if you have longer feedback. Uh, checkpoint at radioNZ.co.nz. Scientists are warning that a vast expanse of floating plastic waste in the northern Pacific Ocean is much bigger than previously thought and growing exponentially. Researchers estimate that about 80,000 tonnes of plastic are trapped by currents in what's become known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, drifting around between California and Hawaii. 80,000 tonnes, that's 16 times more plastic than previously thought. Here's the BBC's Helen Briggs. Every year, millions of tonnes of plastic enters the ocean. Some drifts away from the shore and is swept up by one of the ocean's huge rotating currents into a soup of plastic waste. Researchers used boats and planes to estimate the size of the biggest garbage patch in the Pacific. They came up with a figure of 1.8 trillion bits of plastic in an area three times the size of France. Much of the plastics found as tiny particles which can be eaten by fish and enter the food chain. But the researchers also found bottles, cartons, fishing nets, toys and even a toilet seat. Laurent Le Breton is from the Ocean Cleanup Foundation in the Netherlands which led the study. 
He says the findings are alarming. Plastic concentration is is you know is increasing, and so I think um, you know the situation is getting worse, and that that really like highlights the urgency to to take action in in you know stopping the inflow of plastic into into the ocean and and also you know uh, taking measures to clean the existing mess. The plastic will persist until the effects of the sun, waves, and marine life break it down into smaller pieces. Researchers at the foundation hope to deploy new technology designed to scoop plastic out of the ocean before it degrades. They say the plastic counts already equivalent to 250 pieces for every human in the world. And unless action's taken, as more is discarded, this will only continue to grow. I just received by ear mail pineapple lumps. Pascal pineapple lumps. The final batch of pineapple lumps will roll off the assembly line tonight and what really will be a bittersweet moment for the Cadbury factory in Dunedin. Chocolates and confectionery have been manufactured on the site for 150 years. This is really multimedia at RNZ. Now we've gone, this is what we're doing with the new money from the government, buying pineapple lumps, but also, listen, just all that extra noise. Yeah, oh no, Pip bought it with her own money, she's saying, sorry. Chocolates and confectionery have been manufactured on the site for 150 years, but in a couple of hours' time that will come to an end when the final 30 staff at what was once a major employer in the city will watch their last product being created. This really is the end of a very long era. In Dunedin, our Otago Southland reporter Timothy Brown has this report. For decades, workers have filed in and out of the purple-trimmed, whitewashed building in Dunedin's CBD for shift after shift, five days a week. But about 8.30 this evening, the machinery at the factory, which was once home to 350 workers, will come to a stop for the final time. It's crazy. I don't know. You know, it's just pretty sad, really, for everyone in Dunedin. And, yeah, it'll never be the same, you know. And, uh, yeah, it's a huge loss for the big family factory sort of workplace that it was. Chocolate will never be the same, I don't think. <laughs> That's Teresa Gooch, who worked at the Cadbury factory for 17 years. She's not alone in her years of service. Some staff have been employed for decades. Some families have been there for generations. And Teresa Gooch isn't sure what she'll do next. It's a, it's a big change coming, you know. Um, yeah, I do like familiar things. I don't really do change, but I think I'm ready. Uh, have you got something to move into? Uh, not really, not at this stage. Teresa's future might be up in the air, but site manager Judith Meir says while the closure is sad, there is a silver lining for many of the workers who have left the factory already. We've um, actively gone out this week to see what has happened with the people who've left the business. Uh, we've managed to contact well over 90% of um, the people who have left and we're delighted really that um, over 90% of people have either secured employment have retired or are taking time out. Judith Meir says the manufacturers working tonight will return next week to help decommission the plant, with engineers and contractors working to have it fully decommissioned by September. The factory's owner, Mondelez International, is moving the chocolate production to its sites in Australia. Etu's food sector industry coordinator, Phil Knight, expects the full gravity of the closure to hit workers in the coming days. Of course, there's sadness. Um, I think that will probably really kick in uh, when they finish their normal production work at the end of this week. Uh, there'll be uh, most of them remaining there on site through until the end of next week, helping out with the clean-up and um, some of the decommissioning. Um, and it's when you're not doing your routine work, that's when things like this tends to really hit home. I think that's when the, the real sadness will come in. Phil Knight visited the site this week and says the atmosphere was vastly different to that of years gone by. It was an interesting thing to walk through there yesterday to, uh, to go through the, the various levels of the factory where there used to be just a, a hive of activity. You know, there'd be dozens of people working on a floor, which is just now... It just cleared from one end to the other. It's all very clean, but it's ghostly, it's, it's eerie. The irony of the original home of chocolate in New Zealand ceasing production shortly before Easter hasn't been lost on locals. For the workers, indeed for the city of Dunedin, this time of year may never be as sweet again. In Dunedin, for Checkpoint, Timothy Brown.
It's uh, just over a minute before six o'clock. Anna Thomas has just arrived with the six o'clock news. Um, I've got a tear in my eye and a pineapple lump in my throat, says Jeff. Yes, 150 years of confectionery on that side. And as Timothy was saying in that story, generations of some families have worked there. Uh, Re Air New Zealand, Mayor Bond seems to have very selective memory regarding Air New Zealand not marketing the Whakatani region. Recent uh, safety video with Rachel Hunter showed White Island. In the last two years, Kyoto magazine has featured White Island and Motu trails in Opotiki. Has it? I don't remember that. Anyway, last year, Air New Zealand supported BOP tourism with a marketing campaign in Australia to attract people to the BOP. Yep, you guessed it, White Island once again featured strongly. White Island, by the way, is just off the coast of Whakatane. Uh, my uncle spent his whole working life working for the main Cadbury factory in Birmingham, UK. He visited the Dunedin factory 20 years ago and couldn't believe how backwards it was. Be nostalgic if you like, but if you don't keep up and innovate, closure is inevitable, surely. Yes, although the not keeping up and innovating was surely a decision of the employer and owner rather than workers, right? Anyway, thank you for your feedback. We really appreciate hearing from you. 2101 is the text number at six o'clock. RNZ News at six o'clock. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. The man who died in a rafting accident in Queenstown today was an experienced guide. The general manager of Queenstown Rafting, Luke Taylor, says the guide had just gone through the rapids halfway through a trip on the Shotover River this morning. There were 11 passengers and three experienced guides on two rafts on the trip. Logan Church reports. While recovering an overturned raft, the guide spoke to the trip safety kayaker, but shortly afterwards he was found unresponsive in the water. Mr Taylor says CPR was performed and a portable defibrillator used until paramedics arrived, but the guide did not survive. The man was one of Queenstown's most experienced guides and staff are devastated. He says rafting operations have been suspended and an internal investigation will be conducted. Police are investigating and Maritime New Zealand and WorkSafe have been informed. This is Logan Church. The New Zealand share market has ended down 1% after Wall Street dived on fears of a global trade war. Asian markets also fell in line with the main markets in the United States, which closed down about 3% after President Donald Trump started action to impose tariffs on China. New Zealand's benchmark top 50 index ended down just under 1% or 85 points, which is an improvement on the opening. It also uh, nearly 40 points higher than uh, at the start of this week. Australia's ASX 200 index has taken a bigger hit and was down 2% in late afternoon trading. Any US tariffs are expected to be directed at Chinese technology businesses, which have been accused of stealing American intellectual property. China has said it will retaliate and agricultural crops such as soybeans are being touted as a likely target. Disgraced Waikato Health Chief Nigel Murray has repaid about $75,000 to his former employer. Dr Murray resigned in October after spending $218,000 over three years on travel, accommodation and related expenses. A State Services Commission report released yesterday said over $74,000 was personal spending that needed to be reimbursed and $20,000 was still outstanding. The District Health Board's acting chair, Sally Webb, says the remaining money was paid yesterday, meaning the board had recouped everything that could be easily identified as personal spending. She added more may be sought later. We haven't closed the books entirely on this. It may well be through other investigations that are ongoing that there are other monies that are identified. So we don't want to close the books, but we're certainly pleased that we've got the agreement that the 75000 has been returned. Sally Webb. A widened upper man in a wheelchair and his parents have not found suitable housing despite being on the social housing register since the end of January. They'll have to move out of their current rental on April the 1st. The family have been working with the Ministry of Social Development and Trust House, but so far none of the properties have met the needs of the man who is also legally blind. The charitable organisation's chief executive, Alan Pollard, says it's never seen such a demand for social housing. 
we, for example, you know, four or five years ago, our occupancy at Trust House was around 93%, and today it's in excess of 99. Uh, we only have two vacancies. In both of those houses, we have tenants waiting to tenant the properties, and uh, we have another 50 families waiting. Alan Pollard says they have plans to build new houses, but they need the funding from the government to make it happen. The Hokitika Wild Foods Festival has come under fire for an advertisement it used on social media that some are describing as racist cultural appropriation. The advertisement features a woman wearing a Native American headdress and Māori designs alongside the festival's logo. Indigenous rights advocate Tina Ngata says it is an inappropriate use of sacred ceremonial dress. But the Westland District Mayor, Bruce Smith, says there's nothing wrong with the image. The organisers deleted the image today after hundreds of people called for its removal on social media. In two and a half hours, the final pineapple lumps will roll off the production line at Cadbury's Dunedin factory. At the time closure was signalled a year ago, 350 workers were at the site. Timothy Brown reports. Cadbury's eight-decade history of producing chocolate in Dunedin ends tonight. The final 30 or so manufacturing workers will finish their shifts this evening. Some will return for another week or so to help decommission the plant before the doors are closed for the final time in September. There is wide speculation on the future of the site, with one possibility being the new Dunedin Hospital. The factory has been a stable employer in the city for well over 100 years, first as biscuit manufacturer Hudson's, with some Cadbury workers being there for decades and some families for generations. Workers have acknowledged the sombre atmosphere at the factory this week. In Dunedin, Timothy Brown. It's five and a half past six. Two sport and rain is hampering the New Zealand cricketers' bid to drive home their advantage over England in the day-night test at Eden Park in Auckland. So far, over two hours of play has been lost to the weather, but it didn't stop black cap skipper Kane Williamson from becoming New Zealand's most prolific test century maker, scoring his 18th test 100 and surpassing a teammate Ross Taylor and the late Martin Crow on 17 test hundreds. He was eventually out for 102. The players are still off the field with the Black Caps 229 for four, a lead of 171. While it's still early in the Super Rugby season, the Crusaders coach Scott Robertson knows things have got serious very quickly for his side. After losses to the Highlanders and Hurricanes, Robertson says tonight's match against the South African side, the Bulls in Christchurch, is a must win. He's confident, however, the defending champions can overcome the issues that are hindering them. There should have been a lot of detail in, in making sure we don't gloss over where we need to be better. And look, that's my job as a, as a head coach to, to get everything we need to, to make sure that the next game we, uh, we're performing and get a result. So there's a little bit of edu training. So um, it's the expectations that come with the jersey and, and we have to drive it ourselves. Scott Robertson. The Olympic rowing gold medalist Hamish Bond continues to thrive in his new sport of cycling, winning the men's time trial at the Oceania Road Cycling Champs in Tasmania. Bond finished over 30 seconds ahead of his closest rival and will contest the time trial at next month's Commonwealth Games. And the New Zealand golfer Lydia Ko is two shots off the lead after the opening round of the latest LPGA tournament in California. And that's the news. Tonight on Nights, Country Life discovers the healing power of fishing. Obviously not for the fish. We have a sonic tonic dedicated to weather forecasting and our something for the weekend performing at Wellington's Cuba Duper Street Carnival. This Balkan Klets for Gypsy Party Punk outfit, the Lemon Bucket Orchestra. And on Lately at 10, we're live and we'll be keeping you up to date with the world, talking to some of the people who have made the news or just worth talking to. That's Lately with Karen Hay on Nights with Brian Crump on RNZ National. And now the short forecast from Med Service to midnight tomorrow. Northland to Tomaranui, including Coromandel Bay of Plenty and Taupo. Showers, some heavy and possibly thundery. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, fine spells, but also a few showers for you. Taranaki rain developing with heavy and thundery falls until later tomorrow. 
Whanganui and Taihape to Wellington, also wider up. Showers clearing and fine spells increasing, but rain returning tomorrow, mainly from the afternoon when heavy and thundery falls are possible, especially about the ranges. Marlborough, Nelson, Buller and Westland, outbreaks of rain possibly heavy and thundery at times. Canterbury and Otago excluding Clutha. Showers spreading south today. Some may be heavy and possibly thundery in Otago and the south of Canterbury tomorrow. Clutha, Southland and Fiordland partly cloudy, but a few showers about the south coast spreading elsewhere tomorrow. Some heavy and possibly thundery during the afternoon. And for the Chatham Islands, fine spells, RNZ National. It's nine past six and you're listening to Checkpoint with John Campbell. And I hope you're going to share those yes, pineapple we will. lumps. Yeah, yeah, we will. break them out now? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Anna Thomas. Uh, it's been lovely having you with us. Are you back Thanks. next week? Uh, no, well, no. Morning report next week. Okay. Well, we always enjoy having you around. Thanks, Thank Anna, you. and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Too. Uh, lots of feedback coming in on Cadbury, and it's all negative. Hi, John Pineapple Lumps. Great sympathy for the workers, but the confection itself is a ghastly thing. Uh, this person, Sarah, says, I haven't bought a thing manufactured by Cadbury since the diabolical snifter withdrawal. Some things can never be forgiven or forgotten. Shame on Cadbury Mondelez. Never again will their chocolate pass my lips. Whitakers only from now on. Regards, TT. We often get feedback like that when we cover the closure of the Cadbury facility in Dunedin. Thank you all. Texas 2101. It is 10 minutes past six on Friday night. China is urging the US to pull back from the brink after Donald Trump announced plans to slap tariffs on up to $60 billion in Chinese goods that stoked fears of a global trade war and sent shivers through financial markets, particularly in the US and Asia. The benchmark US share market closing down 3%. Mr Trump says the tariffs are necessary to counter unfair competition from China and are in retaliation for years of intellectual property theft. The BBC's Washington correspondent Philip Williams has this report. China, 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 China. It's been something of an obsession for President Trump. From his election campaign to today's announcement, China has been in his sights. Today, he pulled the tariff trigger. Just use the word reciprocal. If they charge us, we charge them the same thing. That's the way it's got to be. That's not the way it is. For many, many years, for many decades, it has not been that way. And I will say, the people we're negotiating with, smilingly, they really agree with us. President Trump says his country's 800 US billion dollar trade deficit with the world is no longer going to be tolerated. He says China is responsible for 500 billion of that. The tariffs will affect around 60 billion dollars worth of Chinese imports, and there'll be new protections against the transfer and theft of American technology. It is the largest deficit of any country in the history of our world. It's out of control. We have a tremendous intellectual property theft situation going on. And while he signed an order clearly targeting China this time, he's warned nations and trading blocs like the EU, they could be next. This is the first of many. This is number one, but this is the first of many. Even before the president had announced the tariffs, the Chinese government made it clear they would fight back. Hua Chunying is spokeswoman for the Chinese foreign ministry. China will certainly take all necessary measures to resolutely defend its legitimate rights and interests. Hua Chunying reminded everyone that China is a significant market for agricultural products like soybeans and that 25% of Boeing aircraft are sold to Chinese airlines. Barry Bosworth is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institute. So what we're worried about is that now we get into some game where in response to a problem that's not caused by trade uh, tariffs and similar measures, we start using that mechanism and uh, it could get out of control. While on trade it seems things are about to get messy, President Trump wants to keep the Chinese on side when it comes to the crucial issue of North Korea. I view them as a friend. I have tremendous respect for President Xi. We have a great relationship. They're helping us a lot in North Korea. But today was about trade, an attempt by Donald Trump to honour his election promises to rebalance the national books and perhaps reset his presidency amidst the turmoil of Russian investigations, sex scandals and resignations.
There was the BBC's Philip Williams in Washington. For its part, China has urged the US to pull back from the brink, make prudent decisions and avoid dragging bilateral trade relations to a dangerous place. But it also says while it doesn't hope to be in a trade war, it's not afraid of engaging in one. Almost 14 minutes past six. Barack Obama's three-day visit to New Zealand was touted as a chance to showcase this country on the world stage. 320,000 visitors from North America came to New Zealand last year. That number's growing fast and there's a sense the US market has much more to give. So Barack Obama offered priceless exposure, potentially, but exposure requires people to notice he was here. Has anyone? Our reporter Sarah Robson tried to find out. He's got 100 million Twitter followers, um, him promoting New Zealand and trying to get New Zealand to stand out to Americans uh, in a world of just brand um, overload is actually really important. When there are pictures of him playing golf on a pristine New Zealand golf course with uh, you know, incredibly beautiful scenery, that sort of publicity is just priceless. Well, anyone who has that many followers has an impact any time they talk about what they are doing. Much has been made of Barack Obama's following on social media. He's got more than 100 million followers on Twitter, 55 million on Facebook and 17 million on Instagram. But the global superstar statesman hasn't yet posted a single photo of his time in New Zealand. Paul Davis from Northland Inc says they've been eagerly awaiting a snap of his time spent playing golf and relaxing. We were talking about that just a little earlier here and uh, saying we hope he will um, get his Twitter account uh, operational and uh, post some Facebook um, images as well while he's sitting on the plane to Sydney. Paul Davis says that sort of exposure is invaluable. He's one of the most followed people in the entire world. Anything that he um, puts out there about his time in New Zealand is going to reach a huge audience worldwide. In contrast, celebrity chef Nigella Lawson, with a comparatively paltry 2.6 million Twitter followers, has been tweeting photos of her holiday on Waiheke Island. Over the last couple of days, she's posted photos of beautiful beaches and the local food she's been dining on. But Summer Capitan, a senior lecturer in marketing at AUT, says different people do have different social media styles. When Oprah came here, she went crazy with it. She's it's her on a horse. I love it here. I love New Zealand. Nigella Lawson's in Waiheke right now. We've got this very different kinds of people when they visit post different kind of imagery of what's happening for them on their visit to New Zealand. Summer Capitan says Barack Obama has a more statesmanlike image and his brand is less reliant on his social media presence. She says he has a more old-fashioned style. Before we had the clicks, before we counted, it just mattered to us that someone thought we were important enough to come visit. So it's that whole part of the process of simply mattering, simply having people come see you, come see your culture. And, you know, maybe Barack Obama will have a tidbit about New Zealand and the pofri he attended um, when he speaks to other people. International media coverage of Barack Obama's visit has also been limited, perhaps hampered by the lack of media access to the former president's events. There have been photos and videos of Mr Obama's porphyry and meeting with the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in Auckland. But in Northland, media were kept well away from his luxurious golf courses and accommodation. But Ms Ardern says the benefits of visits like Mr Obama's go beyond social media posts and international media coverage. Not every visit like that is all about just pure economic gain. It's what we ben how we benefit and the experiences that those who will have interacted uh, with the former president, even right down to the children and young people who have performed for him while he's been here. All of that makes, makes a huge impact on communities and on our country. Economist Shamabil Yaakob says visits like Mr Obama's are so fleeting, it's hard to quantify what impact they might have on the tourism sector. It's very hard to tell that this many people have come as a result of the Rugby World Cup or the America's Cup or Lord of the Rings or the visit from APEC or the visit from Barack Obama. Increasingly, we're seeing much more of the, I guess, recognition and those kinds of things that's related to social media but very difficult to quantify them and attribute accurately. And Shamabil Yaakob wonders why these visits are even thought of in economic terms. We should be thinking about this from a more of a political and diplomatic perspective. That's why we do it. I don't know why we have to make everything into an economic argument. Barack Obama departed this afternoon for Sydney, where Northland tourism operators and others hope he might be tempted to tweet a fond memory of his Kiwi visit. Mōti hōtaka o te ahi ahi, ko Sarah Robson, aho.
One person texted in asking simply, do we need more visitors? RNZ contacted one of the sponsors of President Obama's visit, Westpac, to ask them how they thought the visit had gone. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Westpac says in a statement it's delighted with the outcome of the trip. It says it's confident it has raised the profile of New Zealand in a way that will benefit our people and the economy. And the bank says the insights he shared at last night's dinner, particularly around issues like raising the proportion of women and leadership, resonated deeply with the audience. Westpac believes President Obama showed a genuine affinity for New Zealand and hopes he will be back soon. The Whakatane District Mayor is calling for an interline agreement with Air New Zealand to force the airline to promote regions it doesn't directly fly to. Tony Bond says the agreement would work like a code share agreement with passengers able to book through Air New Zealand, check their luggage right through and use Air New Zealand lounges if of course they are Koru Club members. Air Chathams has been servicing the city since Air New Zealand axed its flights to Whakatane back in 2015. Our producer Bridget Burke asked Mayor Tony Bond if he thought he could attract Air New Zealand back to the district. We've been serviced very well and I don't think they would be welcome back now, but I try and work with them because they are our national, well, they are our national airline, not quite though, but um, I do try and work with them. But um, yeah, they seem to shut the door on us and there are opportunities for, for them to work. And I think that the interline agreement and access to the business lounges would be a huge um, advantage, not only to us, but to them. If they, they, the, the people that fly Air Chathams, I would say that there's uh, a number that fly on, and they fly with Air New Zealand, or they could fly with Jetstar, because you've got the choice when you get to Auckland. But I know when I, most of my flights are to Wellington, and I always go um, Air Air Chathams to Auckland and, and down, but when times are a little bit tight, it makes it very hard because we've got to rebook in. We can, we haven't got we haven't been ticketed right through, so uh, there are some pressures for that. And sometimes you can't get to Wellington as quickly as you could if you were it was an interline agreement. And you've written to the Transport Minister today. Um, I saw um, the Minister on the AM show, and I thought, well. He was talking about Air New Zealand withdrawal from services and provincial New Zealand is important to the government, which we totally agree with the government on that. We, um, I think we he needs to talk, he said he was going to go and talk to the CE, Chris Luxton. Now I think that what he needs to do with Chris is talk to him about how Air New Zealand is marketing themselves as a national airline. If they want to retain that national airline status, why don't they embrace the feeder airlines which have come in since they've pulled out and actually are feeding their main trunk lines. And by doing that, they need to bring in the interline agreement, which um, Air New Zealand are very well aware that they've held one with, um, I think, in Tonga for a number of years. Uh, well, maybe I've got the island wrong, but they have got one in one of the uh, Pacific Islands where they where the interline agreement me means where somebody can go seamless from Whakatane through to Wellington, uh, our bags are booked in in Whakatane and it will just end up in Wellington. So it's, that's where we need uh, Air New Zealand to actually come to is accept the fact that they don't want to come into some provincial airports, but please, why don't they work in with these feeder airlines? But the airlines would still remain utterly independent of Air New Zealand, but it would be sort of a collegial effort to have some sort of schedule cohesion with each other? Yes, and see, currently we are silent. Uh, if you look at an Air New Zealand book, Whakatane doesn't exist. They don't market Whakatane anymore. And, and particularly with government departments, we have, um, and big companies, which uh, deal with Air New Zealand uh, at a, in a high level, they tend to not fly with the feeder airlines because they've got a, you've got to book separately. So if you could book with Air New Zealand and come right through to Whakatane and they just there's an arrangement arrangement with them and Air Chathams or Sound Air if it's um, one of the air, airports that Sound Air do, and then it just means it's so much easier. It's been done in the past and. They've put up barriers saying that they can't do it, but I believe they can. They they have got the system in place, and Air Chatham say they can work, do it. So if if anything, if they want to stay out of the provincial airports, 
work in with the, the feeder airlines and that will actually make it so much better. We need the airport for economic development. In the Eastern Bay of Plenty, we have thousands of new jobs coming up with um, industri- industrial um, construction in Carrow, um, agriculture in Apodiki and tourism, tourism in general in the, in the Whakatane region. So there is huge growth in the Eastern Bay of Plenty and the airport is just a nece- necessity. It's not a luxury. That's the uh, region's mayor, Tony Bond, talking to our producer, Bridget Burke. Just before we go on, no progress still. Uh, Black Caps England, the day night, day two uh, at Eden Park. It's been raining. The covers are on, or at least the wa- they were the last I heard. Uh, play has not resumed, even if they're off. The Black Caps, 229 for four, uh, a lead of 171 over England's first innings total. It's not often you get to say that someone's leading by 171 uh, when someone's 229. Thousands of teenagers meeting at sports tournaments around the country this week may be at risk of taking mumps back to their hometowns. At least three of the nationwide secondary school tournaments have issued no warnings or advice to the young people competing, despite a mumps epidemic in Auckland. Rowan Quinn reports. Mardi Cup, the National Secondary School Rowing Championships, is in full swing on Lake Twizel, bringing together about 2,000 young rowers from around the country. But they could be bringing home more than medals. A senior official says organisers have been given no advice from health authorities about mumps, which is at epidemic levels in Auckland. That means they've passed no info on to the competing schools. That's something that worries the director of Auckland University's immunisation advisory centre Nikki Turner. People can have mumps and not have symptoms. It's highly feasible that teenagers, adolescents will go to these big tournaments and mix and spread mumps to others. I would expect that to be highly likely. And it's not just Māori Cup. Organisers from the Wakaama School Champs in Rotorua and the Volleyball Champs in Palmerston North, which has 1,900 competitors, also say they've had no word from health authorities. The operations manager from Volleyball New Zealand, Julie Carpenter, says at a tournament last year they issued a warning and advice on mumps after getting a message from the Ministry of Education. That included vaccination reminders, cleaning balls between games and courtside hand sanitizer. Ms Carpenter says she would like to have heard more this time. If on a personal level I wasn't aware that the mumps um, outbreak was, was still having an impact like it was at the end of last year um, and if that is still a concern for health authorities yeah I think it would have been probably sensible for something to come out. By coincidence there's been a stomach bug at this year's tournament so strict hygiene measures have been in play. The Immunisation Advisory Centre's Nikki Turner says teenagers are at particular risk of contracting mumps because they're part of a group of New Zealanders with low rates of immunity and their sociable nature puts them at even more risk. Mumps travels, mumps enjoys travelling and mumps will spread when adolescents, young adults group together in close conditions. The Ministry of Education says the only health information it provides to schools is at the request of DHBs or the Ministry of Health. RNZ asked the Health Ministry whether it was its job to issue mumps advice to school tournaments and why none had been given. In a brief written reply, the Ministry said it did not routinely collect information about such events and its approach is to raise awareness about the disease and the importance of receiving two doses of the MMR vaccine. The Auckland Regional Public Health Service says it did issue advice to Auckland schools for the recent Polyfest Cultural Festival held in the area. Nikki Turner says everyone in the health sector needs to take more responsibility. It behoves all of us at the national level, at the district health board level, at the local level to try and get the messages out to let people know, think about mumps before it's too late. The number of notified mumps cases in Auckland stands at 1,204, with small pockets recorded in most other centres. Auckland Public Health Authorities say the rate does appear to be slowing as more people become immune through vaccination or exposure to the virus. More Checkpoint, Corrowan Quinn, DNA.
Items from the career of New Zealand cricket great Martin Crowe will go under the hammer in a divorce auction in Sydney next month. And West Coast sports fan Adam Gilson is hoping to get his hands on them so they can go to the National Cricket Museum in Wellington. Actor Russell Crowe is holding an active divorce auction, having split with his wife, with about $5 million worth of items being sold. Among them, the bat his late cousin Martin Crowe scored his last century with against England at Old Trafford in 94. Adam Gilson has a set up a give a little page to fund the bid, and he spoke to sports editor Stephen Houston about why. Growing up in the 80s was, was a wonderful era for New Zealand cricket and Martin was at the forefront of that um, with some other very special cricketers as well. So I guess when you're growing up you have sporting heroes and, and Martin was definitely one of them for me. So just to think of these wonderful pieces being carved up in an auction and going to private collectors you know, all around the world was such a shame and, and knowing Jamie at the museum would, you know, wanted some help. I thought, well, that's something we can all do. We can all get in together as a nation, um, you know, try and get a, a bit of a fighting fund, if you like, together, and let's go to auction and see if we can bring some of these pieces back. Are you disappointed it's being auctioned at all? I mean, this is Russell Crowe, Martin Crowe's cousin. You'd think he might have decided to perhaps offer them to the, the Cricket Museum himself. Well, that would have been lovely. I guess when it comes to a divorce, and this is what it's all about, it's, it's uh, all about divvying up assets, I suppose. I, I see his ex-wife also has some jewellery available um, through the auction. So I, I saw a story this morning where uh, it said Martin wanted to sell this stuff back in 2006 to an auction house in Sydney, and that's what Martin went over to Sydney to do that. And he was staying at Russell's house that weekend, and Russell said, I'll pay you twice as much as what it's worth. And so he, so he bought everything. But he also said to Martin, and if I ever, if it ever gets sold, I'll, I'll pay you half of the, the profit. So what he, what Russell said, look, anything that's made from this, any extra, is actually going to go to Martin's daughter Emma. So I guess if Martin had have sold it uh, privately, we'd never have had a chance to see this. So I think Russell Crowe, to be fair, is actually doing us a bit of a favour. And that is checkpoint for the week. Thank you for being with us. Have a wonderful weekend. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. The man who died rafting on the Shotover River today was an experienced guide. New Zealand's benchmark share index has followed world markets down on fears of a global trade war. The Waikato District Health Board has been repaid all the money owed by its disgraced former chief executive. And the final New Zealand-made pineapple lumps are about to roll off the production line at Cadbury's Dunedin factory. This Saturday from 7, RNZ National plays the songs you've asked for. We may never, 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 never meet again on the bumpy road to love. Plus in Late Night Phil, we'll help Elton John celebrate his upcoming 71st birthday. Blue Jean Bay.